Father, this morning, we thank you for getting up out of the bed this morning, for giving us health and strength to come and worship you. We thank you for taking care of us this week, for giving us jobs, dear Lord, and giving us uh, uh, the opportunity to go to school and to learn. Thank you for academic success, as one of the, uh, the young people said, uh, they're on the honor roll, dear Lord. We thank you for those, those things like that, because we know they come from you only, dear Lord. Father, we thank you for anniversaries. Thank you for our marriages. Thank you for keeping them strong in this church, dear Lord God. What a blessing it is to have somebody to, to lean on in those times of trouble, dear Lord, and somebody to rejoice with in times of uh, happiness. Father, we thank you for those marriages. We thank you for divine protection on the road. The roads have been icy, dear Lord, lately, and uh, people don't drive as well as they should. But, Father, you're always there to uh, watch over us. And we thank you for the special testimony about uh, being protected from somebody who was uh, acting a little erratically. Father, we, ask you for, we, we thank you for restored health. We have a uh, testimony about how you healed us and how you uh, brought us back to uh, a sound body and also a sound mind. Uh, we thank you for answering prayers of parents, dear Lord. And we still have some out there that we still have some children out there with our parent, uh, from uh, in our midst that uh, need to be brought into uh, your fold. We pray, dear Lord, that you continue to draw them as you, as you always do, dear Lord. You're always knocking at their hearts. And we pray, dear Lord, that we are given the right words to say to them, to show them that you love them all, always, dear Lord. Father, we thank you for the Spirit leading us and guiding us every day, for telling us where to go, for whispering in our ear, giving us guidance, especially with Joanna going down that hill, Father. We know that your Spirit guides us in all things, that we listen and we are attentive to what you're trying to tell us, dear Lord. We have some petitions to bring before you this morning, dear Lord. We, we pray for, for guidance uh, on what jobs to take, and, and we ask for open doors and closed doors. Uh, we ask for comfort, dear Lord. There's been many uh, losses of life uh, lately, even in my own family. And, Father, we ask for strength and, and, uh, and resilience in these situations, dear Lord. We ask for the words to say to uh, family members to keep them encouraged. And, uh, dear Lord, we, we know that uh, death is temporary. It is only sleep. And for those that trust in you, we, we should see them uh, on that great day, on that great banquet day. Uh, we pray for the shut-in that are unable to come to church, dear Lord. Uh, they're shut-in, dear Lord, so we need to be moved to go visit them and not just uh, sit in our own homes. We pray for our veterans that are overseas right now in war and in conflict. And for all the uh, unspoken requests, dear Lord, we lift them up to you, knowing that you care so much uh, about us and care for every little need that we have. And we, we find comfort in the fact that you are our Father and Jesus is our brother. We give all these things before you and giving honor to your holy name right now. Amen. Scripture reading can be found in Genesis chapter 3, verses 5 through 8. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. 
Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Good morning, happy Sabbath. You are the strength of my life. You are my song, is what I'll be singing today. I will glory in my weakness. I will boast in your mind. For I have found in my weakness that you strength of my life. You are the strength of my life. You are my song. You are the strength of my life. When I am weak, you are strong. You are the strength of my life. You are my song. When I'm weak, I will praise and be strong. When I'm weak, you're my strength and my song. Lord, please keep me in weakness. Melt my heart in your light. Fill me, Lord, with your brokenness. Pour through me with the strength of your life. You are the strength of my life. You are my song. You are the strength of my life. When I am weak, you are strong. You are the strength of my life. You are my song. When I'm weak, I will praise and be strong. When I'm weak, you're my strength and my song. I will worship you, Jesus. I will bow in your sight. Your power is perfected in weakness. By your blood, you're the strength of my life. You are the strength of my life. You are my song. You are the strength of my life. When I am weak, you are strong. You are the strength of my life. You are my song. When I'm weak, I will praise and be strong. When I'm weak, you're my strength and my song. You are the strength of my life. You are my song. You are the strength of my life. When I am weak, you are strong. You are the strength of my life. You are my song. When I'm weak, I will praise and be strong. When I'm weak, you're my strength and my song. Praise the Lord. I want to thank Sister Helen for that great song. I like that. Uh, I, uh, I called on her to do me a favor this week, and I know she's busy. So I'm glad that the strength of her life is Christ, because that's, that's the only way it works. I also want to thank uh, our sister Crystal uh, for doing the scripture reading. Many of you are probably new to Stuart and Crystal, but we we welcome them in with open arms, and we appreciate you for uh, volunteering, <laughs> for being volunteered, however you want to put it. <laughs> um, I also want to praise the Lord for our, we have a brother here, uh, Dan. We have a couple visitors here, uh, uh, but Dan in particular, a young man here, uh, is from Romania. 
Now we're teasing because we have another family here from Romania, so uh, we'll all get to talk about the, the, the great Romanian food. Uh, and there's a sister, some of you are complaining about the weather, but we have a beautiful sister in the back here from Chicago. <laughs> And she says, I prefer this weather. <laughs> I'm not lying. She said, I prefer this weather. So as cold as it feels to us, just know there are those who prefer this weather. All right. Let's bow our heads. Father God, we thank you for today. We thank you for life. We thank you for strength. We thank you because you love us with an everlasting love. We thank you because you don't just walk with us by the way, but that you carry us through the storm. We thank you for watching over every aspect of our lives, Lord. And, and Father God, I want to thank you for protecting me from me. So many times when I've done things headlong, and Lord, you've just been a safety net. So Father, I thank you for that. In Christ's name I pray uh, today. Amen. A few weeks back, we were having children's church, and uh, I asked a question to these, now these kids are, none of them are older than nine or ten, and I said, have you ever made a, a small mistake? And every one of them raised their hand and said, yes, I've, I've made a small mistake, and they went through one by one and talked about these small mistakes that they've made. And then I said, well, has anyone here ever made a big mistake, really, really big mistake, and all of them, one by one, held up their hand, yes. I've made a big mistake. And, and they went one by one and individually talked about their unique, big mistakes that they've made in life. And I thought, how cool is that, that, you know, at the age of nine, right, they could look back on their <laughs> illustrious life and, and they, could distinguish, they could pick out the mistakes in their life and, and they could, in fact, distinguish between the small ones and the really big ones, you know. They didn't have to be reminded about these mistakes. These were mistakes that they still remembered, you know. And, and I thought about how in my own life, the role mistakes have played. Some of you, like me, you know what it's like to wake up. And not the kind of waking up that we've done every day of our lives up to this point, but the kind of waking up that defines time. There's a kind of waking up that when it takes place, the only question really is, did you wake up before something, or did you wake up after? You know what that kind of waking up is like, Connie? It, it, when, when you wake up before something, right? You know what that feels like. That's, that's one of those, whoo, whoo. And, and, and you're happy, and you're excited, and, and, and you're praising God because you woke up before. When you wake up before, you're, you're just thinking, man, why didn't I wake up sooner? I can't believe that. It's amazing. You talk about it. You share these stories with your friends and your family of how, you know, you were going to do something, but, oh, uh, you woke up. But when you wake up after... Anyone here know what it's like to wake up after? After you've made the decision. After you've committed the sin. After you've made the career choice. After you've said, I do. When you wake up after, you don't want to share those stories after you've relocated. You don't want to share that story. Because when you woke up after, there's not a lot of praising of God. Not in my life. There's not a lot of storytelling. After. Adam and Eve woke up after. When I looked over my own life of mistakes, the, the one thing that seemed to be constant in the big mistakes in my life 
was a lack of talking to God. It was the single thread I kept going over, these big mistakes and one after another, after another, after another. There was always this sort of strand of thread like, yep, 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 didn't talk to God on that one, didn't talk to God on that one. And I've shared many of stories here in church, but man, there are stories that I'll just never share. Because <laughs> I woke up after, and I don't want, you know, when you wake up after, you're hoping nobody sees it. You're wondering, how bad does it look? Am I camouflaging it enough? You know, am, I, am I able to hide it just enough that it doesn't look like I really screwed up? If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Genesis, chapter 3. Crystal covered this in the scripture reading, but we're just going to touch on it a little more. Just go back. Genesis chapter 3, first book in the Bible, uh, Old Testament, Genesis chapter 3, and and we're going to look at verse 6. It says, and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat. And gave also unto her husband with her. And he did eat. And we don't know um, how long after it was that they woke up. And we, don't, we, don't, we, we know they, they, they eventually woke up. We don't know how long after. Uh, we, we know that it could have been a minute, a couple of minutes, could have been a couple of hours. But eventually... They woke up and they realized, in fact, they knew that things were different now. Things were forever changed now. There was no turning back the clock at this point. And I wonder just exactly what that conversation might have been like between Adam and Eve after. Well, I mean, I mean, imagine now they've, they've already done this. They've already committed the act. And, and Eve now is, is all of a sudden looking into the eyes of her husband and saying, Adam, what did we do? A- a- Adam, are, are, are you, I cannot believe that we allowed this to happen. Adam, I can't believe you allowed this to happen. Adam, what did we do? We, couldn't, we didn't go to God about this. Adam, I spent all this time talking to the serpent, never went back and talked to God. Adam, what have we done? Adam, I, I, you know, the serpent was talking and, and all these things were flooding my head and, and my mind and I was having all these thoughts and, and I never took them to God. Adam, what have we done? And, and Adam looks at his wife and he doesn't know what to say. And he says, honey, you're right, I, I don't know. And then in a moment of honesty, maybe he just says, honey, look, I failed you. I'm sorry. I failed you. I failed us. I know what I, 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 we could have taken this to God. I know we could have taken this to God, but, but I'm sorry. And I, I, I'm hoping he doesn't come today. And, 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 and you know what, Eve, quite honestly, you know, I'm not even feeling right just standing here talking to you like, you know, maybe, maybe we ought to cover up a little bit. Something doesn't feel right. The, the same voice, the same voice that they had heard time and time again, they became afraid of. You know, God, we, we accept just how much God wants to speak with us and just how much God wants to spend time. And sometimes in the middle of all that, what gets lost is just how much Satan wants to speak to us too. And just how Satan is so eager to have a conversation with us. But not a real lasting conversation, just enough conversation for you to sin and then he'll go on his way. When I was young, uh, Satan's best uh, mode of, of speaking to me was through music. I'm not, I grew up in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an era of hip-hop. <laughs> and we had a, 
you know, we only had like one or two televisions, so you couldn't bogart the TV. But as a young person, you could get your own little Walkman, $19 or so. And you could put the, walk, put the cassette in and put the Walkman, put the ears on, you know. And, and your parents, grandparents didn't have to know a thing of what you were saying. I mean, I used to use terms around my grandmother that if she knew what the term meant, she would have whipped me. I'm just, yeah, yeah, but I'm talking in my own lingo. When I got older, graduated college, and, um, uh, you know, hip-hop, you know, I kind of shed the hip-hop thing, right? <laughs> I was now on to more sophisticated sin. <laughs> you, know, I was, you know, I was, I was, I had moved on up in the world, you know, hip-hop, that, I'm not in the hood anymore, right? So, so, so I, I, I'm, I'm now, I, I like to watch musicals, you know, the Broadway plays and, the, and, 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 you know, I like to go on Broadway and watch the music, see, because I, you know, I'm all buttoned up now. I got, got a job, got a car. And I remember the second time I went, went down, uh, there was a musical called Chicago. <laughs> Sister might, might even know what I'm talking about. There was a musical called Chicago, and Chicago was real popular, and it was a musical that they had made into a, into a movie, and they had gotten award after award after award. And I said, I got to go see this thing, man. I got to see it live, and I got money, man. So I, I paid my money and got tickets, had great seats. Just I mean, I, I had to be about from here to where Sister Kanye is. I'm, I'm watching this thing, and I'm on Broadway, and everybody's dressed to the nines, and we're sitting there and just soaking it up, and, and the music, and the, I mean, the singing is amazing, and the, and the choreographed dancing is awesome. And at the end of the day, the whole thing was about sin. It was about lying and adultery and sex outside of marriage and murder. That was it. But it was so dressed up. It was so beautiful. I mean, I, I, felt, I felt, you know, a higher class sin. <laughs> sister, sister, sister Martha used to call it dramatized sin. And I never felt bad when I was doing it. Soaked it up. Everybody was looking good. Satan has a way of camouflaging sin so carefully that he doesn't have to force it on you, that you, you'll invite it in. You know what that's like, right? I mean, I mean Satan, has, Satan had dressed up sin so beautifully to Eve that he didn't, at the end, have to force it. The Bible says she took, she ate, and then she shared it in her family. That, that, that's how beautiful sin can get. We'll take it and eat it and digest it and, and then share it amongst those we love. My, 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 my favorite, favorite story in the Bible, um, and, and I can't even go into why it's my favorite story, because uh, that would be a sermon all by itself, uh, but it takes place in the, in the book of Joshua, and, I, and we want to get there, but I, I had this, um, I was trying to figure out why I don't talk to God more often. And ask yourself that question. If you, maybe you feel you talk to God more than enough, and you're like, I'm all done. I've talked to God enough, I'm done. I, I, I can't get any more God talk in my life. But for those of us here who feel like we could talk to God more, Here's the three things that I came up with, and this is just in my own life. One, I spend too much time listening to the serpent to the extent that I become afraid of what God will say. I listen to Satan so often that I become afraid of what God might have to say. Two, and this is really almost uh, laughable, that I actually think I have things under control. I made, I made like so many blunders, like documented proof blunders, right? But somehow, day after day, I wake up and I say, I think I got this under control. I actually, I think I'm good. 
And my third reason is I act many a time, believe it or not, I think I know what God is going to say. I'm 100% sure about it. You know, that's like when you, you know, when you, um, you ever read enough of the Bible to when you look at the, the, the title of the sermon, you know what it's going to be about? Oh, I know where he's going to go. I, I, I go on, I listen to like audio verse, right? And I just see titles of sermons. I'm like, ah, eh, I know what they're going to cover. Let me blow by that one. Let me find a, a title that really intrigues me because that's how I listen. It's the title that, you know, I'm, I can't figure it out. So that's why I listen to that one. But the ones that, you know, if it's, if it's real blatant, you know, Daniel 8, I kind of know. I know where you're going. I feel like I know everything God's going to say and he can't, there's nothing more that he's going to say to me. So why am I talking to him? Satan will camouflage sin so carefully that he doesn't need to force it. I'll invite it into my life. My favorite book and my favorite story in the Bible is found in the book of Joshua. If you have your Bibles, um, if you're in Genesis, you just keep going to the right. Uh, you'll get past, uh, eventually you'll pass Deuteronomy and you'll get to the book of Joshua. Joshua chapter, and we're going we're gonna to look at chapter 9. And let me just give a little background of the story. This is, this is an absolute beautiful story, an absolute beautiful story. Not for what I'm going to talk about here, but it's an absolute beautiful story. And here's what happens. Joshua um, was, was part of the children of Israel. And this is background in case you don't know the story. Joshua was part of the children of Israel. And the children of Israel had been uh, told by God that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move you into this new area called Canaan. And the people in Canaan are all wicked. They're very wicked and they've been wicked for a very long time. And so I'm moving you in and you're going to overtake the entire area. Um, and, and so, but, but here's what you have to know is, and, and God was speaking to the children of Israel through Moses, says, let them know that when they get there, they are not to make any uh, leagues or covenants or contracts with anybody in the neighborhood. So it'd be as if they were coming up here to the capital region, and God says, listen, you're going to come up to the capital region, and I don't want you to make a contract or, a, or any close association with anyone from Albany to, to Boston Spa to Del Mar to uh, Schenectady to, you know, I don't want you to make a league with anyone in the area. And they said, okay, fine, fine, good enough. And so they come to the area, and they knock off the big city. They knock off, you know, the Albany equivalent called Jericho. They just knock them off, okay? And then, and then they, they come up to this other small kind of, yeah, not too big, like a water of elite kind of city, really small, called AI. And then they, they eventually defeat AI. And so now, after they've defeated this group, there comes these other people called the Gibeonites. Now, the Gibeonites had been watching all of this, and let's say the Gibeonites are like in, in, in the Del Mar area. They're neighbors, right? They're, they're kind of watching, and they know what's going on. And all of a sudden, they say to themselves, you know, Here's what we can do. We can camouflage ourselves. We can dress our, you know, like Halloween. We can put on some old clothes and, and we can take some moldy bread and, and we can walk over to the children of Israel and we can tell them we're not neighbors. In fact, we're from a very far, far, far land. So far that, you know, our clothes didn't even make it to last on the trip. And so we, we, we can camouflage the lies so beautifully that we can get them to agree to make a, a, co a covenant with us. If, if, if we can just talk to them, the, the, we know that we can get them, we can lie enough to get them to sort of accept us. Welcome us into the family. Adopt us. Marry us. And so they do that. They travel, they, they, get, they put the oldest clothes on and, and they grab the moldy bread and all this other stuff that just sort of makes it seem like they came from Florida. <laughs> and, and so they get up and, oh, hey, Joshua, how you doing? And they talk to them and they, they tell them, hey, you know, we, we, we heard about you. You're famous. And, and, and we just want to be your servants. 
we just want to serve you now. If you've been fighting people day in and day in and day out, and someone comes and says, I just want to serve you, <laughs> doesn't that sound appealing? Okay, I hear I hear one guy. All right, let me let me let me put it into I don't want to go there. <laughs> you know, if if you if as a, okay, so let, let's I'll talk to the men. If you're just a man and you you're dealing with all kind of craziness day in and day out, day in and day out, what's the one thing you like when you come home? <laughs> Some amount of, come on, Florentine, come on. Some amount of peace, right? <laughs> now, 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 now imagine you, you're fighting, you're, you're just doing battle, and, and nobody can understand how hard it is to be a man. And so all of a sudden, this girl comes up and says, oh, honey, I just want to serve you. I'm just... The, 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 <laughs> Elder said, I'm going to get him by in trouble. Okay, uh, look, 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 she comes up, she says, Honey, I don't want to fight. I don't want to fight. Take, take a load off. Let, put your feet up, hon. Let me massage the toe. What, how, how, what hard day today? And, 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 and all the men are saying, well, we would love to see Rachel's home. So I can, I can, I'm hoping that she's not. So, 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 so they came up, and I mean, I mean, if you listen, if you just please, I beg you to read the story. They stroked the ego of Israel so thoroughly, so thoroughly, that, that, that when, you, when, you, when, you, when you get to verse 9, chapter 9 rather, when you get to chapter 9, Joshua 9, verse 14, now they're there with the moldy bread and, and it says here in, in verse 14, and the men, that talk about the, all the leaders now, took of their victuals and asked not counsel. At the mouth of the Lord. In, in the NIV it says the Israelites sampled their provisions. But did not inquire of the Lord. Another version says that they took part of their provisions and didn't, they didn't ask directions from the Lord. So whether you say they didn't seek counsel or whether you say they didn't inquire or whether you say they didn't seek direction, at the end of the day, the result was the same. The Lord had no involvement. And what happens when, when, when she comes saying just, you know, make a league with me, marry me? Verse 15 says, and Joshua made peace with them. And made a league with them. Wow. And let to let them live. And the princess of the congregation swear unto them. It wasn't even just one person. Every man in that group had his ego stroked. It wasn't just one. It was all the leaders. And guess what? They woke up. They woke up. Verse 16, Joshua 9, 16. <clears throat> says, and it came to pass at the end of, the, of three days. Did you get that? After three days they had, that they had made a league with them, that they heard that they were their neighbors and that they dwelt among them. You know how badly that I've always seen this as a marital story, so I can't, sometimes it's hard for me to not see it that way. But it took three days for them to realize, should have talked to God. Should have talked to God. They woke up. When we get tempted by our own desires and by our own egos, we will make lifelong commitments. And sadly, not only will we not seek counsel of God, but we won't seek counsel of those who will seek counsel of God on our behalf. Does that make sense? Not only will we not seek God's counsel, but we won't even seek the counsel of the brother or sister who we know will seek counsel 
on our behalf. So what do you do when you don't seek counsel of God? I talk to myself. I talk to myself. And I'm not God. So my reasoning when I'm talking to myself never comes out right. When I talk to myself, Ben, it kind of would be like this. I got a lot of bills. And uh, now this job here, good job, pays enough for me to take care of my bills. Eh, but it has me working on the Sabbath. But here's the deal. It's not that I just have bills. I have child support. I don't pay child support. I go to jail. Now what good is it for my daughter for me to be in jail? Huh. Maybe I'll take the job. This is what it sounds like in my head. See, when you, when you, when you, when you don't take it to God, it, it, you, you, can, you can reason it out. You can reason it out. Okay, Connie, come on into my head. Here it goes. Now, Connie, she's not an Adventist, but she's really nice. I mean, she's an Adventist in the sense of she loves Jesus, kind of, right? But, I mean... She's not a Seventh-day Adventist if you want to be technical about it. But you know what? I'm getting old. And I'm tired of being alone. There it goes. And guess what? Guess what, Florentine? I'm not doing this single on Valentine's Day again. <laughs> Did it last year. Didn't like it. And I'm tired of trying to act like the happy Christian every time Valentine's Day roll around. And I got to. And you know what? To be truthful, Pedro, dating is expensive. <laughs> okay, y'all don't believe me. <laughs> Jessica, you don't believe me. <laughs> Let me tell you what. I go on a date, I'm Bill Gates. <laughs> now, Seth Q knows me as Bill Moody. <laughs> I sat on a date one time, I'll never forget this, because it, it sticks in my head. I had literally said to myself, if, if something doesn't happen, I, am, uh, I had already gotten paperwork together. I'm like three weeks away from officially filing for bankruptcy. And I get a call, hey, I'm hungry. Eh, where you want to go? <laughs> and I'm out on a date. I'm, I'm three weeks from bankruptcy. And I, and I, and I, and I played the female role, like, I, I'll just have water. I just ate. Um, you go ahead, order whatever you want. I'm good, I'm good. You, I might nibble a little bit of the chicken but you know <laughs> so, so, so I'm tired of, of spending money I don't have and see now I'm married and poor but it's, it's all good so I know she's not an Adventist but, but you, you know she understands me and, and, and guess what it, it's, it's expensive to keep dating and I love her and she loves me and I'm done with the single thing We're going to get married next week. Now, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, um, I'm not uh, uh, sharing something that most of you don't know, but I've been married twice in, in, in my life. And, I, and I, it never left me that the first time I got married, only one person actually questioned me. <laughs> it's bizarre. I got a lot of Christians in my family, friends. Only one person actually said, are you sure you want to do this? 
And it wasn't even a friend. It was just a guy who I was hanging out with him. He was a Christian, and I just thought, wow. It took me back. I remember I was on the, the steps of his house. It was, and it was, I can tell you, some of you know, Larry Menz, a guy named Larry Menz. I'll never forget it. First person that ever questioned me. And I said, oh, yeah, of course I know what I'm doing. I, of course I know. I don't dare you question me about this. You don't know me like that. I talk to myself. I talk to myself way too much. Sin can blind us so much that we take on the role of God. And when I take on the role of God, I make decisions for my life without God's input. I accept things and I agree to things that have nothing to do with God. And the longer I wait to talk to God, the louder the enemy becomes in my ear. Lloyd said something years, uh, maybe a year ago or so. I, I, I wanted to use this comment. I've used it multiple times. But he said, fish don't see water. Never forgot that. You can be so into something. You can be so surrounded by, by something that you're just a fish and you don't see, you, you can't see the water. And, and when God is trying to direct you, you've just surrounded yourself with your own reality of life. And so you never go to God because what's the point? I think I can see everything clearly. Fish don't see water. Proverbs 3, 5, if you know it, say it with me. It says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to your own understanding. What does that mean? It's not as if the Bible is saying, just lean on your understanding partially. <laughs> just, just, just 80%. Lean not unto your own understanding, because when I lean on my own understanding, when Bill leads on his own understanding, he makes huge decisions that have real bad results nine times out of ten. And if you go longer, it's 10 times out of 10. I make real bad decisions when I lean on my own understanding. And so God's like, bring all your questions to me. Let me sort it out. Let me figure it out. I'll tell you what it's going to take to do it. One of the things that um, is, is awesome is the fact that the Bible, for as much of, for all of the Adam and Eves and for, for the times where we have these stories of Joshua and the, and the others uh, moving without talking to God, is we also have stories in the Bible where they did go to God. I mean, how good would a story be if you never heard of when they do go to God? Because I need to see it. You need to see it. There's a story in the Bible. I'm glad to see Sister Shemek here because there's a story in the book of Nehemiah. The story in the book of Nehemiah. Now, if you have your Bibles and you're in Joshua, keep sort of going to the right. Uh, you'll pass Samuel, Kings, uh, Chronicles, and then you'll pass Ezra, and then the book of Nehemiah. Shemek's son is named Nehemiah, <laughs> hence the reference. Uh, Nehemiah. Nehemiah was an average man with a, with a rather important job, though. He was the cupbearer for the king. Nehemiah was an Israelite. And Nehemiah, you know, if you're, if you're a cupbearer, you're, you're like the food taster. And so the last thing you want to do as the food taster for the king is not look like everything's all good. These had to be the most smiling people on the face of the earth. And so one day, Nehemiah uh, asked what's going on in his hometown of Jerusalem. And so he gets the news that Jerusalem was really down. Jerusalem had been torn down and, and the gates had been burned up. And so he, he hears what's going on in his hometown. And Nehemiah was so distraught and mentally in anguish that he only had one reaction. And that was to pray. I mean, I mean, he, he, he hears all this, and, and so, but his only, his first, his instinctual thing to do, as, as instinctive as Johanna praying when she's in the car saying, Lord, Lord, something, something's got to happen, as instinctive as that, all of a sudden, Nehemiah goes immediately into prayer. 
And so in, 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 in chapter 1 of Nehemiah, we get this conversation. Nehemiah says, and it came to pass on verse, in verse 4, he says, When I heard these things, that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. And then he says, and this is what I said, and I said, I beseech thee, O Lord, God of heaven, the great and terrible God that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. Let thine ear now be attentive and thine eyes open that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant, which I pray before thee now, day and night, for the children of Israel, thy servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which have sinned against thee, both I and my father's house have sinned. It, it, it's always, it's never lost on me. When Nehemiah prayed, he's talking about a city he no longer lives in. But when he goes to God about it, he doesn't keep himself out of it. He, in fact, says, I've sinned. I've sinned. And, 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 and somehow he sees his role in, in this whole cosmic conflict of saying, I've sinned. And it, it'd be nice if every time I heard something on the news that was really difficult and hard to hear, that I would not just say, well, that guy messed up and that guy needs to go to jail. But it'd be interesting if I were to say, oh, Lord, I've sinned. Oh, Lord, I've sinned. I heard a story this, this week, a guy, I don't know if it was North Carolina or not, uh, but he goes into a house and shoots like assassination style these three young, uh, young students. And then the debate is, well, it was because they were Muslim. Or uh, the other debate was it was because of a parking space. If you're the, if you're the mom or dad, does it really matter? Yeah. But when I heard the story, I, I sat there and all I could say was, I hope the man goes to prison. Never saw, never went to my knees, never said, Lo, Lord, I, I've sinned. I can't believe all the, these things that are going on in this country. I never saw my role in it. I just kind of said, yeah, that guy messed up. That guy sinned. That guy needs to go to jail, and I hope they get him. Nehemiah hears of all the bad things and the difficult things that are going on in Jerusalem, and he puts himself right there and says, I've sinned. My father's house has sinned. No longer, dis you know, sort of distinguishing himself from the conflict that's going on. We have dealt very corruptly against thee, he says, and have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the judgments which thou commanded thy servant Moses. Remember, Remember, verse 8, remember, I beseech thee, the word that thou commandest thy servant Moses, saying, if ye transgress, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. Oh, but if you turn unto me and keep my commandments and do them, though uh, there were of you cast out into the uttermost part of the heaven, yet will I gather them from thence. And will bring them unto the place that I have chosen to set my name there. He's in, he's, in, he's in deep prayer. This man is in deep prayer. And it, you know, I don't know if, if, uh, if it was when it was that God talked back to him. But at some point, God talked back to him and said, this is what you're going to do. You're going to go to the king. And when you read the story later, I mean, he, he asked the king for a number of things, like one thing after another after another. And you think, boy, oh boy, that almost seems a little bold. But he had already talked to the king of the universe. And so the king of the universe gave him that, that encouragement to go. And, and when he opened his mouth to the other king, to this earthly king, he could speak. And so he goes there and... I, I got to tell you this, what, what, what's beautiful about the prayer is, 
in verse 11, he says, uh, I pray thee, thy servant this day, grant him mercy in the sight of this man. For I was the king's cupbearer. He says, Lord, Lord, he said, grant me mercy in the sight of the king. I'm going to go to the king. But he, it was as if when he prayed, he was unleashing God like a horse. Go in front of me. Go in front of me. And so when, 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 when Nehemiah finally got in front of the king, normally if, if the cupbearer is not looking right or not looking well at dinner time, that, that guy is just taken off and, and, and maybe killed or whatever or definitely lost out of a job. But instead, when he goes out there not looking right, not looking like himself, the king says, hey, what's wrong, man? And that alone lets you know that, that God had already ran ahead. God had already been there. God had already shown up. God had already started to, to massage this heart of the king so to say, don't worry about what you see. Don't worry about his face. In fact, ask him how he's feeling. Ask him why he's so sad. We've gone out. I've gone out a few times with Ben and Marina to knock on doors. And before we've gone out, and every single time we go downstairs and we'll, and we'll say a prayer. And we'll say, God, you know, go before us to these homes that we're going to go. Because we don't know where we're going. And we don't know whose house we're going to knock on or, or what we're going to experience when we get there. But, God, we just know that you need to go in front of us. And the sad part is I wish I, in, in every instance of my life, if I took that and applied it to Lord, I don't know when I'm waking up and I'm, when I'm getting in the car and when I'm walking to the, to, down the driveway. And, and Lord, if I just kept that same prayer, God, keep going before me. Keep going before me. But instead, I get up and I go to work. And I walk into the office and have a conversation with someone. Not asking God, talk to him before I do. Talk to these folks on the road before they get on the road. We've got a year this year of prayer. This year, we're going to be talking about prayer, asking God to go before us. I want to point out a few, th as I'm, I'm, I'm closing, I just want to point out a few things. Uh, Pastor Gomez made a request. I shouldn't even call it a request. It was more of a charge. Um, and I don't know how many were here or how many heard it the way I heard it. But the charge was that when you come to church, that you'll pray that God will give you someone to pray with. And when he said it, I, I, it hit me. It, it, um, all of a sudden, I felt like a, a, a visitor at the church. Not in, a, not in a bad way, meaning I, I was putting my mindset in the, in the eyes of a visitor. And, and what would a visitor be like? Walking into the church. Imagine walking into the church for the first time. And you don't know much about the church or much about the beliefs or the, or the, or the ethnic makeup. You're not, you don't really know a whole lot. But all of a sudden, you're in church and you just see two people over here praying. And, the, and, and you turn around and somewhere during potluck, you turn around and you see another two folks praying. And then upstairs, you walk around and just randomly, maybe by the back door, you see another two folks just in prayer, holding hands. And you go into the side room, maybe to sit down with your food, and you, you sit in a little blue room, and you walk in there, but oh, there's some people in there praying too. And imagine how beautiful that would make you feel. I mean, that, that, that's the kind of, you, you, if you walked into that kind of church, would you not say, I, I'm home? I, I, I'm where I need to be. The only way it happens. The only way it happens. Is if individually. We commit to prayer. It's one thing for the church to say we're going to do this thing. Commit to prayer for a year. But it's a different thing if I say, Bill, you're going to commit to prayer. And you're going to commit to sending God before you in everything that you do, in every small thing, in every big thing, so that you don't make the same mistakes that have littered the rest of your life. There are very few uh, 
relationship stories that I admire. If you ever want to hear a good relationship story, and I don't want to put someone on the spot, but at Potluck, ask Helen or Pedro what things were like before they married. And I've heard the story a few times. And it's always been warming as a Christian the role that prayer played in their lives before they got married. Let me go back. Before they decided. When you hear that kind of story, it just lets you know it's, it's possible to let God go ahead like an like a unleashed horse and clear the way. I want God to do that in my life. I want, I want to be a, a sanctuary of prayer. Jesus and Matthew said it as a quote. Isaiah says, my house will be a house of prayer. My house will be a house of prayer. Father, we ask that you will prepare us in a unique way to be those who you've called us to be. Lord, we ask, dear God, that the, the prayers that we need will be given. We ask that as it will become a community of prayer, Father. I'm, I'm praying that we will, as we come to church, that we'll pray with our brothers and our sisters. And throughout the week, that we'll find our brothers and our sisters. Because we all need it. We need prayer more than we need scold. We need prayer more than ridicule and judgment. We need you to be in our lives and move us so that we don't do anything except you tell us to do it. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. 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 Stand as we sing in number 485. I must tell Jesus.
desire to give us instruction in life. So, Father, we come to you, thanking you, praising you, knowing that you're the only one with the answers for life. Father, we can't see out of the water we're in. Bless us as we leave here this day. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.